Um, okay, so switch point stories. Where, where, where did this come from? Okay, the place it came from, I used to, as Phoebe said, I used to be at the University of Utah. Catherine, you learn a lot of interesting things in Utah. Among the things that I learned living in Utah is about Catherine Bond Stockton's work. She wrote a book a few years ago, Beautiful Bottom, Beautiful Shame. And um, in it, she uses the metaphor of switch points. Um, she's an English professor, so she is writing about visual texts like pulp fiction, um, uh, texts on the page like Toni Morrison's Beloved, and looking for ways that the signs of queer and black crisscross. Um, in, in many cases, this is what intersectionality theory has been trying to do. So, in terms of in the back of your brochure, and then now here, this is a, a, a bit of language from uh, Beautiful Bottom, Beautiful Shame, cribbed out, showing that what she had in mind was a metaphor, switch point that is both, it brings to mind a railroad, um, electrical currents, and also a shift or transference, especially if sudden <coughs> or unexpected. And very much of what we are hoping to do, we'll try not to make too many sudden moves, but the hope for this conference the dear hope for this conference is that each one of us may come out thinking or feeling or seeing or hearing something in an unexpected way. Like learning a new word, something may change as we leave this. So part of how we hope to do that is by calling forth various methods of knowledge, not just the intersectional identities. So here's a nice picture we found on the, on the web of the um, switchboards. There's a remarkable number of pictures of switchboards. Um, and the crisscrossing identities there, of course, kind of suggest the idea of the change and that, they, they, that in fact, a wire will cross from one point to another. It's not fixed and it's changing all the time. Um, and it's somebody's job, of course, to keep it going, which is how domestic work. I'll finish up these comments and then read a, read a bit of, a, the, of my book um, to explain why it is we include domestic work. But workers really are intended to be present as an on-the-ground thread from the beginning of the conference last night with Serena Mayor. I mean, excuse me, I'm sorry, fast forward back up with Andrea Mercado's talk um, is with the issue of domestic workers. Um, as we were looking and thinking about this, um, the question is why we chose um, switch points and why we choose stories. We choose switch points, as I said, to get a new metaphor, something that's maybe a little more concrete, maybe a little more portable into the trenches of activism into a legislature, into a policy-making meeting about how it is that law, when it looks at issues like AIDS, HIV, juvenile justice, um, domestic worker protections, um, can look not just at the one part of a person, but at the confluence of all these um, places. And as Serena Mayor's book, Reasoning from Race, makes clear, it is extraordinarily difficult to simultaneously hold multiple identities. So it's not a small task that we have set out for ourselves. In the spirit of that, I would like to invoke not just the work of the people whose shoulders we are standing on, but also their faces, with the idea that we are all embodied. These are people we are talking about, the women in the video last night, with families and lives and, and, and flesh and, and nerve endings. So as we do this, I'd like to keep in mind the human and the cerebral, you know, the heart and the brainy stuff that we're usually um, tussling with in law schools and in our various workplaces. Um, so as I was thinking about that, I um, thought about who those folks might be if I could invoke their spirits and bring them into the room <coughs> and their work. First, of course, is Audre Lorde. So, Paul, so Audre Lorde's among the many wise things she says, and Sister Outsider in 1984, she says, I find I am constantly being encouraged to pluck out some one aspect of myself and present this as a meaningful whole, eclipsing or denying the other parts of self. Our job is, of course, to try to answer her long ago call to, um, to find a voice to speak to those multiple selves. In addition, 
I'd like to include Carol Gilligan. So um, right around the same time, 1982, Carol Gilligan writes what Harvard University Press calls the little book that started a revolution, where she comes up with the idea of a different voice. All her books have musical metaphors at their heart. And of course, she's talking about moral reasoning of women as opposed to men. There are all kinds of anti-essentialist claims. But the reason I would pull her to the front is to suggest that she gives us a language and a um, valuing. Part of the revolution of, the, of In a Different Voice is suggesting that different voices count, that different voices, in fact, add richness and not necessarily, we don't have to set up a hierarchy of saying one is better and therefore um, should have uh, priority. Um, another, of course, is um, a fellow law professor, Patricia Williams, who 10 years later, in 1991, writes The Alchemy of Race and Rights. She very much pulls on that invitation of speaking in a different voice to write a book that talks about both how law does treat and has treated people of color in extraordinarily unfair ways and tells it from her own personal experiences. So the reader who does not embody her subject position can nevertheless feel herself being locked out of a Benetton's for not being deemed safe enough to come in off the, off the street. And so this is what um, Patricia Williams says about what she does in The Alchemy of Race and Rights. Her goal is to pull together little bits of law and everyday life in weird combinations to show and not just tell how law treats wi uh, men and women of color the way traditional legal writing cannot. And that's very much in the spirit of what we're trying to do, is solve really big on the ground problems in our various contexts, but trying to think about it in new ways to, to, um, that incorporate the personal truths that we have. If we were to think of a patron saint for this, because there is a theme of, um, we mentioned that there's a minister, I could tell you that, I'm, and I don't know all of your religious situations, but we have some Christians, we have some Jews, we have at least one Buddhist, and there are doubtless other stripes of spirituality an area of life that is remarkably personal, cannot be tested or contested in rational terms, and yet is hugely important. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a patron saint? And if we did have a patron saint, I think it would be Polly Murray. Um, I'm not going to give away all the um, extraordinary information that um, Serena Mayori is going to share with us about Polly Murray. Um, at lunch, other than to just say she is somebody we should all know. Every single person who has learned of Polly Murray lately that I know of comes away thinking, I can't believe I don't know her. How is it that this extraordinary woman, who is a key architect of sex discrimination law, race discrimination law, women in clergy, um, how is it that we could not know her. Um, so that's, I will just put her out there and her face, which is, which is an important part. Also that she wrote a memoir, Proud Shoes, in, in 1956. She writes at the heart of McCarthyism. She writes the story of her grandparents, this interracial family in North Carolina. And when she says in her introduction, she says, <coughs> and when it's reissued later, so she's maybe 30 years later, gets, gets a bit of distance on it, she said the reason she wrote a memoir is the country was gripped by the hysteria of McCarthyism. The fear of communism was rampant. Anyone who championed a liberal cause was vulnerable to the charge of disloyalty. Um, as a civil rights activist fighting against racial segregation, when challengers of segregation were few and defeats were customary, I found it imperative to declare my American heritage. She's making a claim for a space and she's making it in the first person singular. And that's part of the power that we seek to um, tap here. Polly Murray also said that one person plus one typewriter equals a movement. <laughs> now we're of course coming from not typewriters, but computers at this point, but certainly a movement. Among the many movements that Polly Murray prefigured directly relates to 
why it is we came to the theme of domestic worker protections. <coughs> so Polly Murray has a sexual orientation and a gender identity that didn't have a lot of clear labels at the time she was living in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and that's part of why she, I don't know whether she would be gay or trans or lesbian if she were alive today. Um, the reason that um, I think she particularly fits our conversation is because she segments with what is a pressing issue among the college and law students and other young activists that was, did not define my coming of age politically, say, in the 80s. So Polly Murray is, um, she graduates number one in her law school class. She gets a Rosenwald scholarship to go to Harvard Law School and get an LLM. And um, the dean says, we won't let you in because we don't take women and not one to be cowed. Polly Murray writes back and says, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements. <laughs> this is 1944. I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements. But since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, me. I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds. <laughs> so um, in that idea of appealing to you to change your minds, we've got lots of data, we've got scientists, we have activists, we also have a thread to the extent you want to accept the invitation of speaking in the language of memoir and sometimes as relevant the extent to which faith of various stripes informs your activism um, with the idea of, of transcending the tendency <coughs> to put, say, gay people and religious people in opposite camps. All right, so how did we get here with domestic workers? We got here after rejecting other possible patron saints who really should be here. James Baldwin um, is clearly a patron saint here, so I will invoke him, but we don't have too much time. Keith Haring must be here. Um, also to invoke the idea of images. There's, it's not coincidental we saw a movie last night and that we're, that we're talking in images today. We, we lawyers talk too much in words, and I, we miss too much when we limit ourselves two words, too many truths. So what happens to the truth when uh, my wife Karen and I host a college student from Stanford last year, a friend of, um, of a friend of, a daughter of a friend. She comes because she comes to Washington, D.C., as many college students do, and because we're in Washington, D.C., somebody sends us her resume. So we see her resume before we meet this lovely young college student. Her resume is trans this, intersectional that, and we're really thinking there's going to be a handsome young trans man who walks in here. He, she's just based on her resume. That's what we're expecting. We do not expect a tall, blonde, Texas, very feminine bombshell. And we are just really surprised because my wife and I are middle-aged and we're thinking the world's changed. This is like hugely <laughs> exciting to have an informant of the next generation at our dinner table. So among the conversation, because we're finding out like what's it like to be in college, what do you and your friends do, what do you think is cool, what do you think is uncool, um, so I ask her, so <laughs> what's the thing with you and your friends that is most unhip? What is deeply embarrassing? What is the political position that is like what your parents would do and that you just can't even bear? Also, like, how do you feel about middle-aged queers, too, is certainly what I was asking. And she said, not getting transgender issues. If you think in terms of gay and lesbian, that is the kiss of death. It is just so unhip. It is just not part of the air that they're breathing. Um, and so I was interested in that. And so I said, well, how's that show up? She's clearly very active on her campus in a number of political issues, looking forward to having a career and figuring out how to manifest that sensibility and her training and her 
her extraordinary mind and abilities toward the end of intersectional justice. So I wanted to know, how's it show up? She says domestic worker initiatives. And she tells me this story about how the queer law students at Stanford have been deeply engaged in the fight for domestic worker protections that we heard about last night. And I'm really, I'm thinking, really? She's like, oh yeah, she tells this story about these shaved head, pierced up lesbians from, from college going up and having these long involved meetings with Filipina domestic workers and they're all working together and I'm thinking it's what my mother would say it's nice to know it's happening in the world it's <laughs> unexpected and you think what could come out of this and what she said was it was the lessons of her queer theory classrooms that needed an expression in activism and it was the domestic worker issue that pulled them in because it was race it was gender it was class it was sexuality because of the issue of um, the patron who could who could um, make life so difficult for a worker behind closed doors um, and also immigration status so I asked her to send some of the materials and she sent a bunch of things because I'm thinking really I'm really sort of surprised I don't get out much so I really thought this was the most amazing story and wanted to share it with all of you so among the things she sent me just from posters they had out at the, the in their college community I am undocu queer um, undoing borders and queering the undocumented narrative criminal queers um, a screening and uh, and um, discussion um, and Asian queers. Now the Asian queers is the part that was familiar to me. That would be along the lines, other than queer, from the sensibility I um, am familiar with. But the other, the call toward intersectionality, in particular the intersection of high theory with a particular concrete legislative action on the ground was an invitation I couldn't resist.